Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm super excited to be speaking with Lewis Joachim, who is an empowerment coach. And Lewis also has this incredible gift to make super complicated things sound very simple. Um, so Lewis helps people to manifest, which is a really like a fancy word, I guess, for achieving what they want. And particularly when it comes to relationships, so like improving relationship with others, uh, creating relationships and it's not just like romantic relationships but it's also friendships pr uh, professional with children etc so today we will be speaking about dealing with toxic personalities and what is actually even toxic does toxic exist or is it just our inability and unwillingness to see past our perception so Lewis super excited to talk to you again welcome yeah. <laughs> I'd just love for you to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit more about what you do. Okay, so yes, as uh, Lena has just explained, I'm an empowerment coach, which is slightly different to a life coach um, in that I help people um, basically develop their personal and their professional lives. In So we work in all aspects from career relationships to self-confidence, uh, mental health issues, emotional well-being, um, I really try and get into the whole part of somebody and who they are. So I focus on their mind, their body and their soul, which means that we have to work within the mental limiting beliefs that they have, any emotional baggage or traumas that they might be carrying around, and then ultimately aligning that with what their soul's purpose might be. So it's a real kind of all encompassing thing, but rather than it being an outwardly focusing thing, what I do is try and really channel inwards into somebody um, so that they can ultimately begin to live their best life. Yeah. And it's so important, isn't it? Because often we just too focus trying to fix things around us and inside of us, it's just, it just doesn't really align. And we know that just by looking outside without doing the inner work, without aligning ourselves to what's happening outside, the results only going to be transient. And then the next thing, and it's the next thing. So I think it's really important to look at ourselves as a whole holistic human beings and doing that integration of all aspects of ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. So let's jump into it. I've got a few questions lined up for you. Uh, personally, I really detest word toxic. Oh, I uh, hate it as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I know you and I agree on that. <laughs> and that's why I really wanted us to have a chat to even explain actually what does even that mean, right? So, but let's um, firstly explore a little bit what actually identifies toxic relationship and then also maybe go into do they even exist? Yeah. So obviously, as we've established, we both hate that word toxicity and Certainly it's banded around a lot to do with um, men. So obviously people use it in terms of, you know, toxic masculinity. And really the only thing that toxicity is, it's it's a form of trauma in some way because it is something that is not good for you. So that can be expressed and projected outwardly into your environment or it can be something that you really hold within you. Um, and then that just breeds more and more discomfort more suffering within you so um in terms of toxicity um as a personal thing that's something that we have to kind of really get to the the root issue of of what is that so i don't believe that there is anything like toxicity um it purely is a personal perception of either you feel safe or you don't feel safe because of either the external factors around you whether that be your interaction with another person or your interaction with an environment so to use the word toxic kind of makes it seem like it's it's something that's external that that just happens to you but actually it can be something very internal that can easily be resolved if you would just take a look at it yeah no absolutely you know I mean I do believe that any relationship we enter into encounter and um, personal platonic uh, in workplace professional is meant to elevate our consciousness it's meant to bring some sort of an experience to help us grow and uh, evolve as human beings so when we in this harmonious relationship with people there is I can't say no growth of course there is growth but not to the such extent and sometimes we really need to push outside our comfort zones right and that's when we 
um, we encounter relationships like that we label toxic, where we're not treated the way we want to be treated, where we may be overlooked, where we found things challenging. But in my opinion, it doesn't mean that they are toxic. All it means is just it's an opportunity for us to look within ourselves, to look deeper within ourselves. And like what you said, nobody is toxic at the core. We're all acting out of our traumas. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just like the triggers that are coming out because we something we haven't really healed within us. And the person we are dealing with is simply, simply reflecting what it is that we have not healed within ourselves. Yeah. And that actually brings me then to the question. So what is the difference between like toxic and trauma? They're pretty much intertwined really, because it all comes down to your perception. So if we were to take uh, an example of a work situation where you're an employee and you're dealing with perhaps your manager and you perceive their attitude towards you as toxic because they're very demanding, they maybe question your abilities, you think that they're perhaps bullying you, and you take that on as being a toxic personality trait that they've got towards you. Mm -hmm. However, that person, your manager, may be dealing with an environment themselves where they're predominantly, if say, for example, they're a female, they might be surrounded by a lot of men, in which case they have to prove themselves as being this strong, accountable person. And ultimately, their job as your manager is to get the best out of you. So if they're going to pull you up on things that maybe aren't, aren't good, then th that's their job to do that, to get the very best out of you. Perhaps the way they do it might not be um, the best way of doing it, um, but that's just how they've been conditioned to, to handle that situation. So the first thing to recognize is, is it actually an attack personally on you or is it something that they're doing that's professionally trying to get the best out of you? Um, and the best way to do that is to self-reflect and be the observer and say, is what they're doing triggering something within me in which case then it is related to a trauma or is it something that they do to everybody in your team in which case then it is something that perhaps they need to look at within themselves as well so it's a case of really evaluating is this a personal thing at me or is this something that's triggering within me and that's probably the best way to really identify it. I love it I mean that's what I said in the beginning you seem like to take this like concept and just like where are you my laptop battery was going <laughs> so you seem to take like this concept and just really break it down and it's such a good point that you made you know is it something within me or is it just their traumas and I just want to get very clear about what do we mean by trauma because trauma to some people means I don't know like I don't know loss of memory right something really <laughs> dramatic yeah. Actually, by trauma, the way I understand it, and I would love um, also for, for your suggestion there, for me, the trauma means is an experience that is a higher than our level of consciousness at the time it happens to us. So, for example, I mean, the example I really like using, which is so simple, is we can be two years old and we drop an ice cream and our parents don't pick it up. And we create this trauma, which is abandonment, right? And what happens usually then we start building those defenses. So as if, if you imagine you come into this planet as a pure energy, soul, consciousness, however you want to call it, which is the only, the only emotion you express or you feel is that unconditioned love. This is all. This is how we're born. And then the trauma start happening and they start conditioning us. We are not loved. We are abandoned. Uh, nobody loves me. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm fat. I'm too thin. I'm whatever that is, right? And they're happening as we go through life. We start building those defenses. And that to me is trauma. Am I along like the right? No, yeah, that's it. I mean, because we would class trauma as something quite severe, like it could be either abuse or a severe accident or or something like that, that would be, you would think would be quite a big occurrence, but trauma can be very layered. So as you said, it can be something very small, like as a child, you develop these experiences early on and learn how to adapt. So for instance, you know, you could have an extreme circumstance of you're a child growing up with an alcoholic parent, for example, you're going to learn very early on that your your safety is a question that you have to protect yourself, that your needs are not being met by your primary carer, the person that's supposed to be looking after you and nurturing you. So you have to self-soothe and, and 
find ways to adapt and that conditioning ultimately as an adult then comes out in all of these you know unhealed ways but it can be yeah very simple things such as you literally one day at school you know you put your hand up you answer a question you get it wrong and the teacher says well no that was that was a silly answer and instantly your subconscious mind has programmed you should never speak up again because you got the answer wrong therefore you're a failure it's the it's the most bizarre thing that our subconscious mind will do but it, it is for your protection because as cavemen and women we're running around trying not to get eaten by lions tigers dinosaurs whatever is chasing us so we have to learn from our experiences and adapt so that we know that a that's not gonna hurt me or kill me or that's safe and that's what we're adapting to learn so each of these experiences you pick up through life from very early childhood is for your protection the only problem is, is that you hold on to them and then they don't serve you later on in life. So if you're somebody that's learned to not express emotion, you're going to struggle in, in later on when you're trying to have a close relationship with someone because you haven't been able to express through your early years. And if you're somebody that's dealt with um, a lot of abuse in your life or, you know, a really unsettled home environment, you're going to find it very difficult to feel self-assured and self-confident. You're going to need constant validation. So if, if you can understand how these sort of traumas, as we call it, develop and how we then protect ourselves, you know, so that we don't get hurt again or we don't get in these situations again, you can really start to understand how your environment plays a big part. And certainly in a work environment, if you're a manager or, you know, a boss, it, it would be so valuable to really see how your employees react to certain things. If you've got an employee who is constantly chasing approval, there is something else underlying that. They're not, you know, they're not doing it for no reason. Uh, just as if you've got somebody who perhaps doesn't take criticism very well. They've probably grown up in an environment where they weren't listened to, where they were were criticized for the simplest things so they can't handle any criticism so even narcissism is i don't particularly like that whole narcissistic thing because again that is a programmed kind of protective development that someone's taken on doesn't mean they're evil in the sense that we've been subjected to by media it's just a form of them having to assert control because growing up they didn't have any so there are so many layers to it, but yeah, it's um, not protection, know. isn't it? Yeah. We just protect exactly. ourselves. We think that by running away from a certain situation, by losing our temper, by shouting at someone, we genuinely believe that at that moment in time, we are serving ourselves. We're doing it because we want to protect ourselves, because we love ourselves. Although yeah. even we may not say that I love myself, but at the <laughs> yeah. meantime, we are doing it because we love ourselves. We want our safety and mm -hmm. we react. So that behavior can appear narcissistic and toxic to other people. But in the meantime, we're just acting. We're just reacting from our wounds and from our traumas. That's all really is going on. Yeah. And, and if, if you've got two people, say you've got two co-workers, one has those kind of like controlling traits and the other person has grown up in an environment where control was a big issue, you're going to have an instant clash of personalities one is going to trigger the other and vice versa, and then you're going to get friction. So at the end of the day, it suddenly then becomes nothing to do with the work environment, but you've created this environment now that you think that person's toxic, this environment is toxic, and it's not. It's just that your own personal traumas are basically rubbing each other up the wrong way, and it's, it's all a personal element, because if that person went away and did their work and you went away and did your work, you would find that you could start to harmonize. So it's it's very key to understand a person's personal dynamic, um, not just their professional. Yeah, so the traumas really, I mean, what we're talking about here, they're also the limiting beliefs, right? That are stored deep in our subconscious mind. And just just to kind of explain a bit more, subconscious mind is like a, is like a record of all, everything, all of the experiences, all of the memories, everything we've ever witnessed, from the time we were born. And those who believe in past lives, I'm not gonna go there. It's in <laughs> from the previous lives, but let's stick to this lifetime. Yeah. That is literally all it is. And what's actually interesting, I was listening to Dr. Bruce Lipton interview. Um, he was a cellular biologist, and then he basically realized um, a lot of 
truth <laughs> about the <laughs> biology, <laughs> rather biology of belief. And it talks about how, I mean, we only create a life consciously, like something 5%, 5 or 10%, it varies from scientist to scientist of the time. So everything else that we're experiencing in our lives is because of the traumas, because of this limiting beliefs that are running in our subconscious mind. They're like programs. And when do those programs get installed is between age zero to seven, right? So it's like, imagine, it's like we're like computers and we've got a software, which is our conscious mind, which is like 10% of the time we're conscious. And then we've got a hardware, which is our subconscious. And this is how we're playing our whole life. And that's why we keep on attracting the same toxic environment, toxic people, narcissists, whatever you want to call it. And we just step into this victimhood mentality because we're not realizing what's actually happening in our hard drive. Mm. And the irony of that is, is it's a paradox that most people who have had that, they attract it because it's actually a safety mechanism because they're comfortable being around those kind of people because that's what they've grown up with. So yeah. it seems counterintuitive, but if you're somebody who is um, quite needy and and you know, relies on that and you've grown up with an absent parent, you're more likely to attract people in your life who are also very avoidant and very kind of like, you know, discarding of you because that's a comfortable relationship that you've experienced. To go from somebody who's very like anxious and nervous and have somebody who nurtures you and cares for you and protects you feels very alien. And you would think that you would be drawn more towards that, but you're not because again, it's it's not familiar, right? And our brain looks for familiarity and similarity and we can't create those patterns. So yeah, we stick to what known and familiar because otherwise it's a risk, it's a danger and we've got to do that inner work in order to align. Actually, in the meantime, we actually want to, right? And that's the thing. Mm -hmm. We want to grow, we want to expand, we want to connect with people who've done the work, who've ascended, who've expanded, but there's something inside of the person goes, I can't do it because of the fear, because of the fear of the unknown. And unless you, like, I think it was Carl Jung said, and I love that quote, I think I use it all the time. <laughs> unless you make your unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Oh, and, yeah. and there's nothing you can do about it. You're literally going to spend your whole life repeating the same pattern, experiencing the same people, the same environment, the same circumstances, until you start taking those limiting beliefs, bringing them to the surface and releasing them. Mm -hmm. And as we know, it's a process. It's not an overnight oh. thing. And nobody yeah. likes looking inside <laughs> the dark and shadows, but unless we do, I believe we're going to have very, very limited quality of lives. Absolutely. And it is a long process. It's certainly nobody's going to be able to click their fingers. And anybody that I've I've worked with, it, it's not an instant thing. It certainly wasn't for me. I know it wasn't for you. And I don't know anybody that can just, you know, wish these things away. But I, I can say, hand on heart, that even the tiniest little tweak in your mindset will make a massive domino effect to the rest of your oh, life. absolutely when you see this belief as false and you're mm -hmm. like it's like changing perception you're like oh my gosh I've been attached to it for like 30 40 years yeah. and literally just like that it shifts and you just you just see it completely different right and that's how what I mean by releasing those limiting beliefs it's just things yeah. start clicking into place for you so, um, I mean, as we, we mentioned, it's a process, you know, uh, to shift those limiting beliefs. And I believe it's those limiting beliefs that create those to toxic environment because we are all literally a bunch of five-year-olds acting from our traumas. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of us, right? People who yeah. haven't done the inner work uh, or haven't been raised by extremely conscious parents and um I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that my parents were bad, but it's just certainly the awareness wasn't there. So what mm -hmm. do we do with it? Let's say we are working in an environment and we've got colleagues or a boss or whatever that we perceive to be toxic. Like, what are the choices? What are the options? Well, the first thing is, it's, it's going to be hard if you're somebody who avoids conflict. The worst thing that you're going to think of doing is addressing it because you don't want to face it. You just want to stay away from it. But the first thing I would get people to do is try and get out of the heat at the moment, step back from it just, just enough to observe and see. So if we take that managerial role, for example, you're thinking that your manager is bullying and, you know, is only picking on you. Maybe ask a couple of coworkers just gently, you know, oh, do you find that that person does this with you? 
Um, even observe how they react to your other co-workers. Do they act the same way? Then you can determine, okay, if they're acting that same way with everybody else and the rest of your team is going, yeah, they're like that with me, you know that it's not just a personal issue for you. But if you do find that you are being singled out, then you know that that person is coming towards you. And in that moment, you can then start to really self-reflect and say, okay, so that person, my manager, whenever they shout at me, I completely close up. Now, why is that? Why do you suddenly withdraw? Why do you feel attacked? Why do you feel threatened just when somebody is raising their voice? That's a moment for you to go, ah, okay, something, something somewhere in my past experience has caused me to have a, an emotional reaction when someone shouted at me. And it could be something tiny, like, you know, your teacher shouted at you, your mum shouted at you, you, you know, something like that. But it, it caused a reaction so, you know, innately in you, your subconscious programmed you to go, when somebody shouts at you, you need to like, you know, close up and protect yourself. So those little elements are the things you need to do, first of all, is determine, is it an actual genuine, you know, person to person attack or is it just how that person is acting towards everybody then I would start to collect actual factual evidence so you can't just go to perhaps your HR manager or somebody and say my manager's picking on me because they say these things about my work that I'm, I'm sloppy or that I'm always late and things like that and I don't think it's fair that's your personal feeling about that that that's you're taking something professional personally so that's that's on you if they they are saying things personally like oh you're wearing that i wouldn't wear that if i was your size that's personal you know that's different but you need to start collecting proper actual evidence as to whether that person is picking on you unnecessarily can you prove that your work is above par can you prove that you're not late can you prove that you are just as good as your colleagues that you can produce results and whatever they're saying to you is not justified. And then you can either have that sit down conversation directly with that person if you feel capable or you take it to HR and then you have to do some form of mediation um, because ultimately the other person also needs to be made aware of how they conduct themselves and they might not be even aware that they're doing it. So you might label them as something and they could be absolutely horrified thinking that that's how you see them. They probably don't see themselves that way. So it goes both ways. You're helping yourself, you're helping them, and you're helping your whole work environment and the company. So ultimately, yeah, you've just got to you've got to address it. You can't just let those sort of things fester because you could leave that job and say that person was toxic. They pushed me out of my job. But if that's a problem that lies within you, you could quit 100 jobs and that's going to follow you in every single job. Oh, so yeah, Absolutely. You've exactly. got to fix it. <laughs> exactly. Because if there is a lesson for us to learn and we just push it away, be like, oh, it's not working out for me. I don't like this boss, this colleague, this person. I'm going to move on. You will recreate a very similar experience until you're ready to face it. You know, and ultimately, I also, you know, I just I personally know that at the end of the day, whether we get hurt, we get angry, upset is our choice. Mm. Right. It is entirely our choice because we don't see things as they are we see them as we are so if somebody has control over our emotions no matter even if the problem lies with them with us it doesn't matter we've got to ask ourselves why am i giving my power away to a person that i don't even like <laughs> yeah right and then as far as i see we've got three choices can we change the situation that's what you were saying like gather the evidence do whatever you've got to do or accept the situation, accept that I'm going to, you know, this person is my mirror. He's reflecting, she's reflecting something to me that I haven't healed within me. Because mm -hmm. if somebody else was in my situation, they would react very differently to it. So what yep. is it within me? And that creates that space and time for self-reflection, maybe even get help. Because at the end of the day, we're going to keep on running away from every obstacle and every challenge. We're never going to grow. We're just always going to seek our comfort and no growth happens in a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the third one, if it gets completely unbearable, you know, just walk away with love and respect and like acceptance that, well, you know, clearly I'm meant to be somewhere else. Right. So change the situation, accept the situation, walk away. 
anything else is insanity because anything else we just drive ourselves crazy and waste time and energy on on things that are just not worth it yeah and that's why i think doing any kind of self-work is essential because i mean in when with my job when i was a florist it's when somebody would complain or say something about a piece of work that i'd created i would take that personally because i had made it they're criticizing the, the piece they're not criticizing me but i would take it as a personal attack so ultimately you still have to do the inner work to yourself because then you become unshakable to everything so where like you say you have that interaction that perception that you think oh that person doesn't like me I don't get on with them I don't like them you ask your co-worker and they're like they're a great laugh I have such good fun I get on really well with them simply yeah. because yeah. they don't have the same internal issues and triggers that you've got so and it happened to me a few times you know I'm yeah. like yeah it definitely happened like I can't stand a person this boss is so evil to me and then like he's like great pals with my other team members and I'm like oh <laughs> Yeah. And, and that is that key moment where you can go, OK, so I'm the only one feeling this, then this is this is on me. And a lot of people don't want to take accountability. They want to kind of project it out and say it's them making me feel like this. It's them that's being in the wrong. But actually, if you could do that work to the point where you dealt with all those issues and someone screaming at you or someone criticizing you no longer touched you, that you were OK with it, you could accept it and go, OK. I accept what you're telling me. I'll work on it. I'll improve it. It's fine. It's no biggie. Or not. Just, or not, yeah. right? You just, but don't just, just get over it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to hold on to those things. So if, if you're getting a reaction from someone else's, you know, input to you, then that's up to you to go, okay, I need I need to figure this out. Because as I say, you, you'll drag it around for the rest of your life. And it, that's not going to help. Yeah. So a few times we both mentioned inner work. Can you give like a maybe a small example of how, let's say, you, you've got somebody in your office or even at home with your partner, doesn't matter, and something isn't gelling, you know, you just you're just not on the same page. Like what kind of inner work can one can a person do in order for them to get into alignments or completely accept the situation, say, you know what, I'm out of here. Like <laughs> what's <laughs> That, well, the first reaction would be you'd want to run. <laughs> you don't want to be part of it. But yeah, inner work, God, there's so many layers with, with doing any kind because of inner work. Like into it. I've got my own thing to share, yeah. but I'm really interested from your perspective. So, so ultimately, there, there's kind of, you have different aspects. So if you imagine everything's like a, a link of a chain. So you've got the thought, you've got the emotion that attaches to that, all based from an experience. So the inner work really is detaching those elements so that every time you think um, or you have a feeling about something, so you feel anxious, your thought is based on the fact that you're feeling this anxiety because of that person, rather than you're feeling this anxiousness because of a past experience. So you have to kind of really separate everything first of all and go, what is the thought? Why is the emotion there? and detach the two from each other. Then the rest of the inner work is simply being that kind of objective viewpoint of saying, why am I thinking this? Why do I believe that that is happening to me? Why do I believe that you know this person thinks this of me? What is it about me that makes me think that that would even be true? And then you may uncover a few uncomfortable things that perhaps you've buried, um, but that's where the inner work starts. It's all self-reflection of literally saying, I have this thought, is attached to this emotion. Why do I have this? And where is it coming from? Um, and once you start really looking at that and shining a spotlight on that, you will start to get answers pretty quick. Yeah. I also got a little process to share, which was really helpful to me a few years ago, where you sit down and you write or stand up, however you want to write it down, <laughs> a list of all the qualities that you want to see in this person, right? So maybe like supportive, accepting, understanding, kind, generous, blah, whatever the list is. And then you go through the list and ask yourself, where am I have not yet integrated those qualities into my life? Right. Mm -hmm. Where am I not being generous? Where am I not being supportive? Where am I? And it doesn't need to be with that person. It can be with your children, it can be with your friend, it can be yeah. with anything. Because we often look for these qualities in other people, but we have not embodied them ourselves. And in fact, then all these people are going to do to us is reflect that. Right. So if we have an embodied, let's say, compassion, we may get somebody who we perceive to be narcissistic. 
Yeah. And I if, start looking you might think of yourself as being this warm, loving person, but because you've got this wound inside you that makes you withdraw when you feel threatened, you are actually coming across to other people as cold and you don't even know you're doing it. So like you say, you, you have to become the person that you want to be and, and yeah. start to project that out rather than being this thing that you, you think you are and that's all you are because that's not. And I think that's where you can change your day with manifesting and other things like that just purely by switching those, those limiting beliefs. And like you say, changing your character and saying, who am I going to show up as today? Um, instead of this other person yeah because yeah. the thing is we we often seek in others what we believe is missing in ourselves mm -hmm. right and I mean this is not even a, something we even conscious of it's not something we are aware of because you know if in our conscious somewhere in our subconscious we believe that we're not good enough then subconsciously we will create relationships that will show us that oh you think you're not good enough here you go yeah and Instead of shooting the messenger, you're like, wow, why am I feeling this way? And this is where the self-inquiry that you've mentioned is, is really handy. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So let's close this. Do you have anything else to add to close this conversation? Which was awesome. Well, <laughs> I would like to set a challenge for people. So anybody watching this. Um, if you believe for any reason that your work environment or there's a colleague that perhaps you are having a bit of friction with, um, you can try the self-inquiry if you'd like to and, and start to look within and find out what it is particularly that that person is, is mirroring back to you. What is it within yourself that you don't particularly like that you see in that other person? But then also make the conscious decision one day to change how you think your day is going. Because the perception is you think, oh, God, I'm going to wake up. There's going to be traffic. I'm going to be late. My boss is going to be breathing down my neck. That really annoying coworker who tells the worst sexist jokes is just going to be in my head in all day. And then I'm going to be exhausted. And there's going to be blah, blah, blah. We suddenly have created our day before we've even set out the door. So mm. I would challenge people just one day when you wake up, decide actually how you want your perfect day to go. And really just give yourself just a couple of minutes. If you need to close your eyes, just really visualize step by step that today the traffic is going to flow. You're going to be on time. Your boss is going to be in a great mood. You're going to close that sale you've been chasing all year, that your coworkers are going to all be in a good mood too, that you're going to have all this, that and the other good stuff happening. And really get into that feeling of today is going to be a good day. And just see how different your day can be compared to when you wake up and assume the worst of everything. Um, and just that little limiting belief that you shift automatically, that change in mindset, um, you will start to see massive differences. Yeah, I love it. We too often start our day unconsciously, you know, yeah. browsing. Yeah, because and of, the baby, because of our past experience, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yesterday it was crap, so tomorrow's going to be crap. Well, yeah. It really decide it will so what do you want to do decide right now tomorrow I'm going to show up and I'm going to be confident I'm going to get my job done I'm going to do this that and the other I'm going to smile because smiling is a massive difference if you're walking into work miserable and you go home going everyone at work was miserable today well they're reflecting back to you you're coming up miserable so they're going to be miserable so go in with a smile go in with a better attitude and you will see that the universe starts reflecting back more of that to you yeah, absolutely. We all know days when we wake up in a bad mood and then we get stuck in a traffic jam. Somebody spills <laughs> coffee on you. It's yeah. just uh, the kids are late to school. You rock up to work wearing your shirt inside out. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, ah. Learn to laugh at yourself. And when you're stuck in traffic, whack up the radio and have a good sing song, you know, have fun with it because you're not the only person stuck in traffic. And I tend to find if I'm in a traffic jam or if I'm late for work, I feel that like anxiety kicking in and that frustration I want to get there I want to get there and then the quickest thing to do is you just whack the radio up you have a sing song and you say look I'm in it I can't change it I can't force this traffic to move any faster than it's going so just accept it and just deal with it and then when you get to work you know whatever happens happens but you know the only thing you can control is your reactions that's it yeah so just to summarize there's some great things you know we both shared here self-reflection why am I thinking those thoughts what emotions are they linked to and is it something that's 
reminding me of my past, maybe my parents, my teachers, you know, the children that trigger that yeah. same emotion that that person is triggering within me. Then create a list of qualities that you want to experience either with well, whoever, you know, you find a challenging person at work with your partner, with your children. What qualities do you want to see in them? And then mirror it back to you. Where am I not integrating these qualities? Where am where am I not showing up like that? And then the third one was what? Wake up the music in a car. <laughs> Basically, just smile. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. The third one is like reality is perfect. You are exactly where you need to be. Radical yeah. acceptance of the present moment. If you were meant yeah. to be somewhere else, you would be somewhere else. Just you are yeah. if you're in a toxic environment, you are meant to be there. If you're in a toxic relationship, you are meant to be there. If you're listening to this video, you are meant to listen to it. Exactly. <laughs> but remember, you can change it. That's the thing. Learn the lesson and deal with it and move on to improve your life. So if you are in that toxic relationship, that toxic job, as we call it, which is just a reflection of whatever's going on in you you can change that you make the decision you make that conscious decision do you want to stay there and suffer or do you want to change it and get better and that yeah. is the only choice you know you stay or you go you make a decision one way or the other and it 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 takes a lot of courage for some people so if you need support get support um whether it be a friend a co-worker someone you know family member don't do it alone. Um, and if you need a coach, then get a coach. You know, it, it, it helps. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'll link the details uh, under our chats in our, you know, in our social media platforms, wherever this video is going to. So people, if you want to get in touch with Lewis, she's awesome. As I said, she can break down the most complex thing into very small <laughs> chunks that even my <laughs> logical mind can understand. So Lewis, it was lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>